Okay, well, very good. Thanks again um, for the invitation. And as I had uh, already uh, mentioned in my previous talk, what I want to do in the next um, 20 minutes or so is to discuss with you whether we are ready to give uh, the bye-bye keys to ejection fraction or not. When I am reading in the Echo Lab at the Cleveland Clinic, and if I pick up uh, the phone, and if I have a referring physician, as one of my colleagues uh, mentioned before, they only have one question, and the question is, tell me what is the ejection fraction of my patient? And then sometimes I find myself providing extra explanations and talking about that story, and I realize that I am just by myself in the phone. The physician just wanted to know what was the ejection fraction. And I don't think that they are to be blamed because the reality is that over time, ejection fraction has been our currency. Ejection fraction is the measurement that we use to decide on surgical timing in valvular heart disease. This is the one that our electrophysiology colleagues use to define and decide on eligibility uh, for device implantation. And as I mentioned to you before, this is the one that we advocate for the initiation and discontinuation of chemotherapy. Let me show you a case. Um, this is a case that I had when I was at MD Anderson. 41-year-old uh, female, uh, echo performed in preparation for chemotherapy. This patient is scheduled to get um, anthracyclines followed by Herceptin, just like I showed you before. And this is the echo. And I want your help. I need show of hands. You have the oncologist in the phone. He needs to know whether this is normal or abnormal, whether you will give an okay for chemo, yes or no. So I want show of hands. Who says, go for it? Start the patient right now. Okay, very good. Who says, I don't like it? Don't give it. Okay, so we have two. So we'll figure out with my talk who was right. Very good. So I always like to show this picture. This is a, a picture of uh, a Halloween parade day when we were living in Houston. Uh, the one in the middle, the better looking one, is my son, Benjamin. And the question that I have for you guys is over here, who is really peddling? Who is the one that is really doing the effort? Is it the guy that is dressed up like a pirate? Is it my son? Or is it the one that is dressed up like a chicken over here? Why is this important? This is important. And in this case, the one that is doing the work is the one that is dressed up like a pirate. And if you take a look, my son and his friend, the one that is dressed up like a chicken, are just enjoying the right. They are not putting any effort. They are just being moved by their friends. So this is exactly the same thing that happened when we analyze heart function in the echo lab. As you can see in this particular case, this is a patient that had an infarct in the medial AD. As you can see, this segment is having no deformation. But if I ask you whether the segment is moving or not, the segment is moving. And the segment is moving because it's being tethered, it's being pulled by the segment next door, which is the base of the anterior septum that was not affected by the infarct and that is causing the segment to move. So this presents challenges for us because it's not that easy to figure out if a segment indeed is contracting, is deforming, or if it's just being pulled by the segment next to it. So what are the options that I have if I want to do a good job defining whether all of the segments of the heart are moving well. One of the options would be to do the M mode, as you are seeing me doing over here. This is in the basal of that anterior septum that I just showed you. So I can measure the thickness at the end of diastole, I can measure it at the end of systole, and then I can figure out if indeed deformation has occurred. But as you may imagine, it will take me forever when we read the 400 echoes that we read at the Cleveland Clinic on a daily basis. Really what I need then is a modality that will be independent from tethering of the adjacent myocardium, one that will give me the opportunity to do characterization of myocardial mechanics for each of the segments of the heart. 
And that is a strain imaging. A strain imaging is defined as the deformation of an object normalized to its original shape. So it's not difficult. It's in a one-dimensional object, you have two possibilities. Either the segment is shortening or it's lengthening. So let me show you the mathematics, because it's pretty simple. So as you can see in this case, we have an object that changed in dimension. Oh, sorry about that. An object that changed in dimension two centimeters. You see it over here. Went from seven to nine. So how do I calculate the strain? Change in dimension, that in this case it was two, divided by the initial dimension, seven, the strain is gonna be 28. So, what are the units? As you remember, when you take a look at the heart, if you are evaluating the long axis of the heart, the heart actually gets smaller during contraction. So as a result of that, I am having shortening in the long axis. So the values that we use for a strain, and that's the reason why in my, in my previous presentation I, I was talking about a strain of minus 19, because in the longitudinal direction the heart is actually shortening. On the contrary, if you take a look at what is happening in the short axis, and that is the radial deformation, you get that the heart gets thicker, right? Gets fatter. So when we talk about radial strain, then we're gonna be referring with positive values. When I went to medical school, this is the way in which the heart was taught to me, kind of like a stack of donuts, basal segment, mid-segment, and apical segment of the heart, and I was told that the heart contracted like that. Nevertheless, if you take a look at our knowledge right now, this is not how it occurs. Really, the contraction of the heart is the perfect interaction from the electrical and the mechanical standpoint of two helices. One, a right-handed helix that starts in the subendocardium and goes to the subepicardium, sub and the other one, a left-handed helix that goes from the subepicardium to the subendocardium, and both are interacting perfectly from the electrical and the mechanical standpoint. As I mentioned to you before, really the way in which you gotta Ambition the heart is like this. You, gotta have, you have a towel, you're trying to get water, and you have the base of the heart having a clockwise direction, and you have the apex of the heart going in the opposite direction, a counterclockwise direction. And if you remember doing this in the past for a towel, it's actually a pretty effective method of getting and squeezing the last drop of water, and that is exactly the way that our hearts are designed. So in order to accomplish that, you need to be mindful that then you're gonna have fibers that go in different directions. You have, and it's very important to remember their location so that then you will know which modality of a strain you wanna use to identify each of the areas of the heart. So if you take a look at the subendocardium, in the subendocardium you are mostly going to have longitudinal fibers. So as a result of that, if you're interested in evaluating processes, like most of the processes that we deal with on clinical grounds every day, hypertension, diabetes, um, coronary artery disease, longitudinal strain is gonna be a very useful tool because it allows you a nice evaluation of what is happening in the subendocardium. In the mid aspect of the thickness of the myocardium, then you're going to have fibers that go in the circumferential direction. And this is important and I'm gonna show you the data when we talk about the patient with heart failure. So if you have somebody that has had progression from involvement of not just the longitudinal fibers in the subendocardium, but you also have compromise of the circumferential fibers, then it speaks for progression of disease and it can be very helpful from the prognostic standpoint. So how does it do it? There are two methods. I'm not gonna talk about tissue Doppler for a simple reason, we don't use it. And then the second method, the one that we use it on clinical grounds at Cleveland Clinic, which is a speckle tracking. So what is a speckle tracking? Well, it's just that. It's tracking the speckles during the cardiac cycle. So how does it work? If you say you have these two speckles and you wanna follow this area during the cardiac cycle, 
then what I'm going to ask the software to do for me is to pay attention at these two speckles. So if the two speckles are getting close to each other, that means that the segment is having the formation, is shortening. On the contrary, if the two speckles are keeping the same distance during the cardiac cycle, that means that the heart is just moving without exhibiting any meaningful deformation. So this is how it looks. It's pretty, that's the reason why I like cardiac imaging, because I find it very obvious to the human eye. Uh, so the way that a strain works is it's color-coded. Red is good, blue is bad. Red will correlate with a global longitudinal strain of minus 20, which if you remember from my first talk is what is normal. In this case, it's calculating a global longitudinal strain of minus 21.7. So this is a very normal heart. You have over here independent values for each of the segments. This is important because it gives you the opportunity to figure out regionality of different processes. Over here, it's uh, giving you the timing of events. So aortic valve opening is occurring over here, aortic valve closure. What you would like to see is you would like to see all of the segments coming together and having the maximum deformation in the moment that the aortic valve is closing. As you may imagine, if the maximum deformation is occurring once the aortic valve is already closed, then who cares? It's not helping anybody. And over here, you have a color MO display that is letting you know when is that that the events are occurring. And what the manufacturer uh, is gonna tell you is that it's supposed to look like a Hollywood red carpet, like this one in this case, where you have all of the segments of the heart contracting at the same time. So, my 41-year-old lady, let's do a speckle tracking and see uh, if the audience was right or not in sending this lady for chemotherapy. And because only two guys say, let's not give it. So the machine over here is um, uh, doing the speckle tracking. It's analyzing right now the longitudinal deformation. Remember that I told you that red was good, blue was bad, pink is not that good. So let's check it out. It's telling us over here that in this projection, the global longitudinal strain is minus 16.4. Not that good. And it's telling me over here by color coding that the inferior septum is doing a great job, but that the anterolateral wall looks pink. Then you would like to uh, have a quantification, and it has done it over here. As you can see, I have pretty awesome strain values over here in the inferior septum, but the anterolateral wall, the values are abnormal, and as you can see, looks like the Hollywood red carpet is interrupted in the middle, showing a problem in the anterolateral wall. Bothersome, right? Now, let's take a look at the apical two. So I have asked the machine to do the same thing, and I think that it's pretty obvious that um, it's looking like the base and the mid segment of the anterior wall are red, and then the distal segment of the anterior wall looks like it's pink and the global longitudinal strain is abnormal. So probably when Ravi is taking a look at these images, he's thinking, well, this is looking like coronary artery disease, isn't it? Um, but let's keep on going. So that's what I thought when I was taking a look at this case. And as you can see, it's pretty obvious over here, the Hollywood red carpet interrupted over here and showing trouble over here in the mid and in the apical segment in the anterior wall. So when I first show this at MD Anderson, they told me how you're gonna be so irresponsible of not allowing the oncologist to give this life-saving therapy to this patient. This technology is new. You cannot do that, you cannot stop it. So then what I did is I did something very mundane. I went to the bedside and I decided to open the chart. And in front of the chart, I had the electrocardiogram that had been obtained that morning. And as you can see, and as Ravi will tell you, it doesn't look that good. You have over here deep inverted T waves over here in the anterior wall and in the lateral wall. So I went and I said, well, we, we gotta be missing something because 41 year old lady, it's sold to us as completely normal. So I decided to go in the room and I said, listen, I am the one that did your imaging today in the morning and I am concerned. Is there anything that you have not told us? And then she started crying and she ended up breaking the news that she was actually a cocaine addict. And then we, when we took her to the cath lab, we ended up learning that indeed she had coronary artery disease, tight lesion in the mid aspect of the left anterior descending, tight lesion as the ostium of the circumflex. So as you may imagine, 
it is not a good idea to take somebody that is already ischemic practically at rest and administer a medication that in 25% of the cases is going to put completely normal patients into heart failure. So what we did is we decided to actually send her to the OR. We did a bypass surgery, Lima to the LAD, saphenous vein graft to um, optus marginal one, and in six weeks, we started the chemotherapy. Uh, the strain had completely normalized and the patient was able to uh, survive without any problem. But then, the question that I have faced during the last uh, six or eight years that I have been working with a strain is people tell me, okay, so you show these nice images when the strain is abnormal, and the question is, so what? What are, show me the data. What are the prognostic implications of you showing the strain? So I want to share with you, I have already done the part at the bottom of showing you our work uh, in the detection of subclinical LB dysfunction in the cancer patients. But I want to do three things with you. I want to show you the impact on prognostication of death in the general population and prognostication of congestive uh, heart failure. So let's start with the first one, prognostication in the general population. This work uh, done by Tom Margwick uh, prior to his arrival at the clinic when I joined asked a very simple question. Let's compare head to head global longitudinal strain versus ejection fraction in its ability to prognosticate who is going to live and who is going to die. So what he did is 546 consecutive patients, known or suspected LB impairment, 91 died at 5.2 plus minus 1.5 years, and they did global longitudinal strain the way that I just showed you, and ejection fraction and one motion score index as mandated by the American Society of Echo. So what he did is he did exactly the same thing that all of you guys do with your patients. He saw the patients initially in the office and he was able to obtain uh, demographic data as to age, diabetes, hypertension, and then he asked himself, what is the modality that has the best added value once I have collected this data? And you have over here the hazard ratio. So to no surprise, age, diabetes, and hypertension came as pretty strong prognosticators. And you have over here the added value for ejection fraction, for wall motion score index, and for global longitudinal strain. And then it becomes pretty clear that the one that gives you the best ability to prognosticate, the one that has the best added value when you have uh, your baseline characteristics, age, diabetes, hypertension, is global longitudinal strain. Um, so why is that? As I was explaining to you guys before when you asked me in the previous presentation, why is that that right now we can do better than the way that we did with ejection fraction? The rationality is that we can see things that we were not seeing before. In the past, we didn't really have good strategies and good modalities to evaluate the longitudinal function of the heart. And as I explained to you, it just so happens that this is the um, fibers that are initially compromised uh, in most of the pathological process that we deal with cardiologists. Second piece of data, prognostication in heart failure. So this is asking a simple question. Patient that makes it into the emergency room, can I prognosticate death and readmission for heart failure? So this is if I use ejection fraction alone. This is if I use diastology, E over E prime from Dr. Naga. This is if I put them together, ejection fraction and E over E prime. This is over here if I add global longitudinal strain and take a look, the extra value that I have in this population when I add global circumferential strain. Why is that? Because if you compare two patients that have exactly the same ejection fraction, the same diastology, the same global longitudinal strain, but if patient number two has an abnormal global circumferential strain, what that is telling you is that that patient has had progression of disease. This patient is not having a situation where his pathology is confined to the longitudinal fibers of the subendocardium, but the process has extended to compromise the mid thickness of the myocardium. And this is, these are conclusions that we were not able to achieve 
before using the technology that we had with ejection fraction. As a result, uh, Dr. Marwi concludes that global circumferential strain is a powerful predictor of cardiac event events and appears to be the better parameter than ejection fraction in the patient that is showing uh, to the emergency room with acute heart failure. Um, in terms of detection of subclinical LV dysfunction, I want to describe to you, just to finish up, what is the role in valvular heart disease? Uh, again, we have been using ejection fraction over and over to define when is the surgical moment for the patient with uh, mitral insufficiency and what is the surgical moment for the patient with aortic insufficiency. At the Cleveland Clinic, the role of um, a strain in the patient with mitral regurgitation is not that prominent because the reality is that the patients that they send to us, they are having four plus MR, and we have amazing surgeons that with more than 90% uh, probability, they will be able to provide a patient a mitral valve repair. So that's what we do. We don't do watchful waiting. We send them, they get a nice repair. The patient goes uh, back home happy. But the question is, what to do with the young guy, for instance, the patient that has the bicuspid aortic valve, that you're trying to kind of procrastinate to move forward in time. But you also want to make sure that you don't procrastinate your decision so much that the, ventricle, that the patient is going to be left with an abnormal ventricle. So this is a very nice study. So what they did is they evaluated 33 patients that uh, had the watchful, the watchful waiting and 29 patients that had uh, surgery. But I am more interested in this side. So what they did is they figure out uh, evaluating these parameters, how can I adjudicate the surgical moment? So the moment when the patient develops symptoms and increasing end diastolic dimension more than 15% or a drop in ejection fraction of more than 10%. So as you can see over here, I cannot really say much with ejection fraction. The difference between the stable and the ones that progress to the uh, endpoint, which is the surgical moment, was of no statistical significance. Same thing with end diastolic volume or end systolic volume. But take a look what happened with a strain. With a strain, the strain was different. The strain for the patient that was stable was minus 19 versus the a strain for the patients that progress was abnormal, minus 16.3. I have already told you what are the normal uh, cutoffs. So what they figure out in this study is that if they use a cutoff of minus 18, they can tease out who is the patient. If the, if the global longitudinal strain is more negative than minus 18, then it tells you that that patient is going to remain stable. Well, if the global longitudinal strain is mathematically higher, i.e. less negative than minus 18, then this tells you that this is the patient that is going to develop symptoms, have a, a ventricle that is going to dilate and drop the ejection fraction as a result of that. But for me, the piece of information that is the most interesting is this one. We have been telling our fellows and our trainees that our tick insufficiency is supposed to be a forgiving uh, lesion where in the moment that you take the patient to surgery, the end diastolic volume index goes down, the end systolic volume index goes down, and the, the ejection fraction gets better. But pay attention to what happens to the strain in these patients. Once the strain was abnormal, it never got better, okay? Which is making us think in a different way, because most likely the damage that is occurring in the longitudinal fibers in this heart is a damage that is permanent. And it becomes imperative then, as a result of that, to use better imaging modalities to define the surgical moment. As I mentioned to you in my presentation earlier, the global longitudinal strain will be endorsed in the upcoming chamber quantification guidelines of the American Society of ECHO, endorsed for clinical practice. It's endorsed in the document that uh, we wrote and I think that you are going to see all of the literature in clinical cardiology modified to use these better parameters. And with that, I thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Plana, for giving us uh, some new insight into how we should uh, start looking at uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction. I'm sure there are going to be some questions. Dr. Pondey, you have any question? Yeah, please. Give the mic, please. Uh, do you think uh, that with, with, uh, the, with the strain now in the guidelines for sending the patients with chronic severe mitral regurg and chronic severe aortic regurg so would change? I I, I am pretty sure that they will change. Uh, as, I, as I show you in the case of aortic insufficiency, ejection fraction, when the ejection fraction goes down, I think it's already too late. I think that probably the same <coughs> principle applies to mitral insufficiency. I tell you, in my practice, I see patients that are taken to the OR on the basis of what the ACC AHA guidelines state, and when I evaluate them post-op, and when I use a strain, or even if I use ejection fraction, they are abnormal. I think that in many cases, we are waiting too long to operate on the patients. Uh, we, we, we saw one patient with mitral regurg recently, uh, a middle-aged lady uh, with preserved ejection fraction. Her end systolic volume per meter square of body surface area was barely 25 ml six months ago, and climbed up to just around 35 ml in six months, she was asymptomatic, but the global strain value had dropped from 21 to 16. Right. Now, that is a huge drop as far as I'm concerned. The lady is asymptomatic, and yet you think this, this should become an indication for surgery? I am, I am pretty sure because what this is telling you is that you are having development of asymptomatic subclinical left ventricular dysfunction, and I think that the guidelines will need to be modified to incorporate these better assessments of um, systolic function. Uh, do you think by this strain imaging you will be able to find out the localized segment abnormality better? Suppose LV dysfunction is there, dilated cardiomyopathy is there, to find out the localized segmental abnormality. I think that uh, the, the way that I see this is that uh, it is particularly helpful in situations where you think that the ejection fraction is normal or is slightly abnormal when you're trying to decide that. I don't find it that helpful uh, except with one caveat that I'm going to make when the systolic function is grossly abnormal. I think that the only exception to that is that when we're trying to decide whether to put the fibrillators or not, the, although it's a very important uh, uh, decision to make, I show you that the technology that we're using is a technology that allows us to recognize differences of only 10 points of ejection fraction. What has been proposed is that we may want to use a strain in this situation and to match the guidelines then the global longitudinal strain that we will be looking for will be a, a, a global longitudinal strain mathematically higher than minus 12. This is if we were to use a very sensitive uh, technique for calculation of ejection fraction, one that will identify ejection fractions less than 35%, this is what we would see if we were to use global longitudinal strain in these patients. But uh, I find it more helpful in the situations where we are trying to identify, as I have shown you in the chemo patients or in valvular heart disease, subtle abnormalities in systolic function, evidence of subclinical left ventricular dysfunction. 